As fans of Higurashi can pretty much all agree on, the series owes a lot of its success to its complex and well-written cast of characters, and more specifically, its unusually large roster of diverse and memorable villains. Shion and Rena, of course, take center stage as the series' quintessential poster girls for the role, and justifiably so, but for myself, I've always been fascinated by Higurashi's lead antagonist, who manages to skirt the fringes of the narrative, ever-present but always beneath suspicion, until the penultimate arc rolls around, when the monster lurking underneath the veil rears its ugly head. And rear it does, with indiscriminate abandon, cutting down our beloved team of would-be heroes one by one with euphoric elation on its way to the Ferude Shrine for a cup of ritualistic disembowelment. The one disclaimer is that I'll be going largely by what is covered in the sound novel. While the Dean adaptation does do a reasonable job covering Takano's voluminous backstory, the breakneck pacing leaves a lot of the important details on the cutting room floor, such as the political machinations driving the unscrupulous organization pulling Takano's strings while also toning down the harsher aspects of her childhood trauma and the viciousness of her reprehensible transgressions, the latter of which the manga adaptation seemed to take offense to, because that adaptation certainly spared no quarter in ensuring its horrific depictions were allocated more than their fair share of the available resources. Anyway, let's get started. Miyo Takano, born Miyoko Tanashi, led a fairly typical, idyllic childhood, right up until the point where everything was completely upended by an unfortunate train car accident which claimed the life of her parents. With no known living relatives, Miyoko is committed to an orphanage where she spends her days and nights in constant fear and panic, as the children within are routinely subjected to physical and mental abuse, ultimately driving them towards a botched escape attempt, the end result of which is Miyoko witnessing her friend turn into chicken feed right before her very eyes. Before Miyoko is punished in the most gruesome of ways imaginable, she is rescued by Dr. Hifumi Takano, a professor with whom her father was well acquainted. Miyoko quickly learns to revere Dr. Takano as her surrogate grandfather, hailing him as her heroic savior, and their time together is reminiscent of the many halcyon days that could have been with her biological family. Dr. Takano's lifelong research concerns the Hinamizawa syndrome, a neurological disease which induces hysteria, paranoia, and psychosis in its victims leading to exceedingly violent outbursts of the variety that usually results in multiple fatalities. Dr. Takano controversially refers to the disease as parasites which have the ability to control people's minds, a claim which earns him the ridicule of his professional colleagues, something that Miyoko bears witness to firsthand, whereupon she vows to also dedicate her life to the field of medical science, assisting her grandfather in proving his contemporaries dead wrong by successfully publishing his revolutionary findings on the disease. Unfortunately, Dr. Takano passes away before seeing his research through to its completion, leaving Miyoko, now calling herself Mio Takano, to take up the mantle of lead researcher on the virus. Through the sponsorship of one of Dr. Takano's companions, a wealthy and powerful bureaucrat named Koizumi, Mio successfully pitches her grandfather's research to the organization known as Tokyo, which has connections embedded all the way up the political ladder as far as the Ministry of Health. The organization plans to use Mio's research as part of the Alphabet Project, with the end goal of augmenting Japan's arsenal of bio and chemical warfare. To that end, Tokyo sponsors the creation of the Irie Research Institute in Hinamizawa, installing Kyosuke Irie as director, providing Mio with the Mountain Dogs as a counterintelligence unit, and fielding Jiro Tomitake as a contracted third-party auditor. As time passes in the sleepy village, and as the finish line comes into view, Mio becomes increasingly drastic and aggressive. When a victim of the Hinamizawa syndrome, the dam construction manager, turns up on their doorstep, without missing a beat, she pushes Irie to carry out a vivisection in order to greatly advance their understanding of the disease. And when Satoko ends up succumbing to the virus, Mio threatens to subject her to the same fate, until Irie brokers a compromise with Rika. And finally, when Rika's parents step in to prevent Rika from holding up her end of the bargain, Mio dispatches the Mountain Dogs to organize their untimely demise, turning her into the de facto purveyor of Oyashiro-sama's curse, which strikes once a year, every year. Thus, a god she does indeed become, just not in the way she had expected. Koizumi, now the principal benefactor of Mio's research, eventually passes away, causing his faction within Tokyo to fracture, leading to a wave of corporate restructuring at the board level, all of whom dismiss Mio's research as crackpot, as well as regarding its parent project, Alphabet, as a major liability. They quickly start on the path of quietly scrapping the Irie Institute, intending to bury Mio's research forever, sending her spiraling into depression, having crossed so many lines to get to where she is that she can't shoulder the weight of having it all be for naught. 
Nomura, a mysterious woman whose nebulous position is best described as the liaison between the Ministry and Tokyo, and who desires the eradication of the Koizumi branch of the organization, approaches Mio, taking advantage of her desperation and undying loyalty to her grandfather's legacy, and encouraging her to pursue the nuclear option. Reveal the existence of Hinamizawa syndrome to the world through a deliberately engineered outbreak of the disease by way of killing the queen carrier, Rika Furude, and leaving her defiled corpse on display for the entire village to witness. The end result of which is, in order to prevent the virus from spreading to the rest of Japan, complete and immediate extermination of all inhabitants of Hinamizawa. It goes without saying that Takano's determination is her greatest asset, more specifically, her obstinate refusal to kowtow to the whims of fate. She first summons and steals her indomitable resolve due to the trauma she suffers at the orphanage, culminating in her dramatic declaration to the heavens, challenging the gods to rain down righteous punishment on her, if her spirit is truly one which is unworthy of an equitable shot at life. From that moment onwards, Takano is reborn, propelled forward by her newfound grit, and with her motivations further seeded by the noblest and most selfless of intentions, to immortalize her grandfather by completing and publicizing his research on the Hinamizawa syndrome. However, every time she manages to regain her footing, fate invariably finds a way to upend her efforts. Her parents' accident is simply the beginning of a seemingly never-ending chain of misfortunes, from witnessing her grandfather's mockery and humiliation, to enduring his attempted suicide and subsequent death, and of course, to finding herself boxed into a corner once the decision has been made to pull the plug on the Kinamizawa Research Initiative. Takano's dogged resilience, the reflexive digging in of her heels deeper and deeper in the face of such unrelenting adversity, is certainly commendable, to the point where Hanyu acknowledges her as being one of the few humans who have managed to set foot on the doorstep of the gods through sheer willpower alone. In this way, Takano's journey is clearly a mirror to Rika's endless struggle searching for the one true fragment, a compliment that Rika grants her in Miyotsukushi, the alternative ending, even going so far as to admit that she is envious of the overwhelming strength of Takano's conviction. The two of them are both pariahs, whose very existence is defined by their ability to overcome countless failures and setbacks, locked away in a lonely war of attrition against fate that the rest of humanity isn't even aware of. The similarities quickly fall by the wayside, however. Even when Rika hits rock bottom, she at least feigns contentedness, forcing a happy-go-lucky smile and begrudgingly embracing her numerous bonds of friendship. Takano, on the other hand, scoffs at the idea of interpersonal attachment viewing others simply as resources to be exploited for furthering her own agenda, though she does express regret about this behavior towards a select few individuals, for instance, Koizumi, whom she regards as her caretaker and guardian after her grandfather's passing, and Tomitake, with whom her relationship was not entirely inauthentic. It's a tactic that her sponsors in Tokyo look at and callously think, well, at least the feeling's mutual, going by how they regard her as nary more than a pawn on their own political chessboard. Because of this, Takano's seemingly sizable cadre of allies belies a solemn bubble of isolation. Which leads me to my next point, which is that, due in part to the lack of any support structure or meaningful connections whatsoever, and exacerbated by the ongoing loss of the few people she did genuinely respect and care about, Takano finds herself shackled by a crushing sense of insecurity, misguidedly believing that her worth, her ability to be accepted by those she feels indebted to, by others, and most of all, by herself, is measured solely by her success in seeing her grandfather's research through to the end. While it's true that she triumphs over the almost cyclical betrayals of fate she faces, deep down, every time the ones on the dice fall face up, as she puts it, it eats away at her soul, compounding the unshakable dread that she won't be able to live up to her own stratospheric expectations, and the guilt that maybe the world would have been better off had she instead been left to waste away in that hellhole of an orphanage all those years ago. Of course, it's not to say that any of this excuses Takano's horrific actions, as she allows desperation to take hold, driving her down darker and darker roads. The sinister manipulation of Irie is just the beginning, as she escalates beyond the point of no return when she orders the fatal poisoning of Rika's father, and takes it upon herself to personally lobotomize Rika's mother, seizing the opportunity to enact first-hand vengeance against someone who has blatantly stood in her path. As the manga depicts in chillingly graphic detail, this is when her true colors are fully revealed, as she savors every second of it, the full brunt of her decades of pent-up resentment and bitterness at the world unleashed all at once, with the target being Rika's poor and unsuspecting mother. Of course, this is further exemplified in the climax of Minagaroshi, where she playfully prolongs her execution-style disposal of the main cast, all while reveling in the same sadistic glee. Takano's defeat in Matsuri Bayashi, and or Miyotsukushi for all you sound novel fans, at the hands of Rika, Hanyu, 
and the friends and allies that they've managed to corral across all eight arcs leaves her a pitiful husk, tear-stained, groveling, and succumbing to the very disease that she dedicated her life to understanding. Han Yu offers her one last chance at repentance, channeling the adage that tragedy begets tragedy, that substituting vengeance for forgiveness only serves to fuel the cycle of hatred and despair, and while Takano does acknowledge her sins in this final confrontation, she ultimately rebuffs the offer, trying and failing to foist responsibility onto the gods one last time by training the crosshairs on Han Yu herself. In a reversal of fortune, Tomitake arrives on the scene, ordering Takano to be brought in safely and without harm to begin immediate treatment. Thus, Takano, someone who is defiant to the end, who carried out sickening atrocities both by her own hand and by proxy, is spared. This outcome is born out of Rika's earnest desire to arrive at an egalitarian conclusion to the summer of 1983, an end to the narrative conflict where there are no losers, as Ryakishi puts it. Thus ends the story of Mio Takano, with the ones on the dice finally falling face down in her favor, but at the expense of losing everything that mattered to her, her research, her position, and her dignity. It's marginally hinted that she doesn't take this opportunity for granted, and that, with the support of Tomitake, she finally takes steps towards atonement. But of course, barring future canon installments, what happens to her after this final parting shot is anyone's guess. In the end, we finally see Takano for who she truly is, a straight-shooting ideologue whose outward confidence masks a precarious psyche full of self-loathing that yearns for acceptance and approval, making her not so different from our core ensemble. She may not be as layered or multifaceted, but she serves as such a magnificent foil to all of them, embodying Rika and Keiichi's unyielding desire to conquer fate at all costs, Shion's obsession with bringing justice to those who have wronged the one she loves, Mion's subconscious fragility hidden beneath a facade of poise and authoritative leadership, and Rena's repressed capacity for unleashing a violent torrent of fury when her back is against the wall. If all the previous arcs were about our club members grappling with, and ultimately caving to, the darkest parts of their souls, Takano acts as a distillation of that darkness. Thus, the final showdown to overturn her doomsday plot goes far beyond echoing your standard friendship conquers all maxim, as, on a deeper, more personal level, Takano's defeat also stands as the most triumphant rebuke of all of their inner demons. Higurashi has always been much more than just a one-sided condemnation of murder, instead posing the question of whether or not it is even possible for others to grasp and truly understand what it is that has pushed a person to the precipice, to the point where they see murder as a viable option, and in some cases the only viable option, something which would go on to be further explored as a central thematic tenet of Umi Neko. And while Takano is undeniably cruel, ruthless, sadistic, and personally responsible for the deaths of innocents, even in the best of fragments, she has extended the same courtesy as any of the series' would-be killers, with her ironclad motivations, internal turmoil, and traumatic upbringing laid bare. How much sympathy is truly instilled and how high or low the justification stacks up is an exercise left for the reader, exactly as Ryukishi intended. Regardless of the answer, Takano is equal parts soft-spoken soothsayer, and cold-blooded sociopath, and will forever be remembered as the tormented girl from the orphanage whose baptism by 10 yen coin was tragically distorted by her latent crippling insecurities, rejection of everyone around her, and twisted moral code, ultimately nurturing a proverbial heralder of doom that wouldn't hesitate to lay an entire village to waste if it meant enshrining the name of the one she loved across all eternity. <laughs> Ah!